Well, this is it. My accidental uh, series, so it sort of became a series accidentally. It started in December, and now we're wrapping it up. So this is it. This is it. You ready? Let's go. We've been on this, for, so this is a fifth Sunday. Um, I was thinking about uh, marriage retreats that we used to attend with Vera back in Finland already a few, few years uh, for a few times. And there were always couples at the retreat that just drew your attention. There was something special about them, something that separated them from the rest of the couples. As you know, when you go to a couples retreat, you don't go there because you have a huge amount of problems necessarily. Some actually use it as a last resort. They're at the brink of divorce. They come to a retreat uh, just to, to get help. And, and that's fantastic. Some of the stories that, that we heard uh, from, from couples like that. But some just do it like, a, like an annual maintenance kind of deal that you do on your car where you just go to, into an environment where you really get to focus on each other, uh, work through stuff, think about things. Uh, but there were always couples there that, that sort of uh, just, they had something special going on. It was just the way they interacted with each other, the way they were with each other. Uh, this, this love and this care and this respect that oozed when they were looking uh, at each other, when they were, the way they were dealing with each other. And they had it. They had it. They had something special about them. They had it. And so you were pulled in. Uh, it was appealing. You wanted to hang out with those couples because there was something about them that you wanted and you wanted it as well. Then there's individuals. Uh, when you think about your life and you go back down memory lane and you think about uh, some people who have really influenced you, that had it. They had it. There was something about them. It didn't matter. Some, some of them might have been really charismatic, exciting personalities. Some of them really quiet and flat and nothing special on the outside, but the inside, uh, the inner life that they carried, uh, the, the characteristics that they, uh, about them, the beauty of their inner being, the goodness, uh, the holiness, the graciousness uh, that they have, um, the, the, the wisdom that they carry, uh, their relationship with God, just so beautiful that, that you're drawn to them because they have it. And then there's ministries, and then there's churches, some have it, some don't. Most churches want it. Sadly, not all. Okay, that's just my weird sense of humor. I apologize again. We'll get on the same page one day. When a church has it, everybody can tell it. And the same is true also when the church doesn't have it, when, when there's nothing going on. Lifeless. You walk into a church, the carpets are 50 years old, and there's a special smell about that kind of a church. You know that nobody here cares at all about anything. Most churches want it though. That's why we're around, right? And when we have it, it's powerful. It's life-changing. Because that's what the gospel is. It is life-changing and it is powerful. And it can be found in all kinds of churches, all kinds of ministries. It Does, doesn't matter what kind of a denomination it is. It can be a really traditional church or a very contemporary emerging church. I don't know if that's even a thing anymore. Uh, it can be a charismatic church or a Calvinist church. All kinds of types of churches that have it. But also in these all kinds of different uh, churches, there are many that don't have it. Some have had it, but lost it. And some are looking for it. What is it? You know when you see it. You know when you feel it. But sometimes it's difficult to pinpoint what it actually is. What is true about those churches, though, is that there is something going on. People are excited. They are passionate. Uh, they, they, they experience transformation in their lives and they want to tell others about what God is doing. Those are signs of some, some kind of churches that really do have it. Exciting to me 
is that I'm hearing more and more feedback and reports from this church, from people that claim that something's going on. That they have it. They found it and they want to keep it. Whether it was, you know, Friday night's uh, event uh, that youth put on, that was something, there was something special there. The atmosphere, the electricity, the energy, there, there, there was something special about it. Young adults uh, gathering from all kinds of different churches, getting together, they seem to have it. It is growing. People are pulled into it. There's outreach stuff going on. People want to be out there telling about God because God is real to them. They have it. Those people have it. That ministry has it. Ladies' ministry, good, good reports from, from uh, the women's small group. There, there's something going on there. Men's breakfast, the small group. Men's uh, small group that gathers once a month around breakfast. There's something fresh going on there. I even have heard about a blaze, some people say. Think about this, that there's something fresh going on in a blaze as well. Something is brewing, something is happening. Bad news is, you can have it, but you can lose it. Good news is, even if you don't have it, you can get it. Can't be copied, can't be imported, but it can be caught. Amen? Because you catch it in your spirit. Hmm. Well, what do we have? What do we have for sure? Let's have a look at some of those things that we absolutely do have, all of us. We started with, with um, looking at the promises of God. But before we go there, let's have a look at a church that really, really had it. Acts 2, verse 42 to 47. If you're from some sort of Pentecostal charismatic background, you will love this passage. This is for you. Because they've got the fire down south. I don't know if we have it out here in north. But down south they have it. It says about the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Did you pay attention to some of the words that were, that were repeated? That's always one of the first things that you do when you read the Bible. Is there something that has been repeated? Is there some words that have been used uh, uh, more, more than once. And all, every soul, all who believed, all things, everything, daily, every day, it was happening for them. It was happening to everyone and it was happening all the time. To all the people who believed, they were experiencing it, they had it, they wanted to keep it going and they were doing whatever it takes to keep it going. Amen? Amen. What happened? There was teaching going on, there was fellowship happening, signs and wonders, uh, you know, happening, possessions. They, they held them in common, they shared everything they had, they praised God, they had people's favour and souls were added. That's what was happening because of what was going on and what they had. What kind of people were these? They were devoted, they were awe filled, they were believing, they were generous, they were glad. This is the kind of people that they were because they had it. As a result of it, this is what was happening, this was what was going on. These were the kind of people that were produced because of it. That's a great passage, isn't it? That's the kind of church we want to be. If you want to have a vision casting about a church, read that. 
read that. Read what was going on in that church. And may that be a sort of a, sort of a blueprint or a guideline or a goal to work towards. But first, you need to have it. Otherwise, you won't see this stuff happening. So what do we have for sure? All of us. What do we have? We have the promises of God. Amen? Uh, many of you have a promise from God. You've had a word spoken of, of your life. You've had uh, prophetic words or utterances uh, spoken into your life, over you. And so you have promises of God on a very personal level like that. But if you don't have a word like that, you have the Bible is filled with personal promises for all of those who follow Jesus. All those who have put their trust and believe in Jesus. The Bible is filled with those kinds of promises. Uh, there was a Canadian school teacher, Everett Storms, who counted 700, no, 7,487 promises in the Bible from God to humans. And last week I asked, who of you are human? <laughs> so if, if, if you're a human being, this school teacher counted 7,487 promises from God to you. Now, some say that it's a, it's a little bit over 3,000 promises like that. Some say the numbers are even greater than 7,487. I don't know, but there's thousands of them. That's the point. There's a lot of promises in this book. It is filled with promise after promise after promise. And all promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. It says, for all the promises of God find their yes in Him. So if you belong to Jesus, if you're in Christ, the promises belong to you. Come on. Oh, am, I, am I here alone today? Like what is happening? This is exciting stuff. We're talking about Jesus here. What do you do if you don't have promises? You look into the Bible. And here is a few. This is just a sampler for you. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises, says Peter. These are the promises that enable you to share this divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In Matthew, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Isaiah, he gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. This is what happens in Christ when you have a relationship with Jesus and you walk in that relationship with him. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And I had actually that Philippians 4.19 here as well, but I don't need to repeat it because everybody remembers it now. John 14.27, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give you is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. So what do you do when you have a promise? You wait for it. You wait for it to become a reality. You wait for it to happen in your life. When you have a promise, you wait for it. When you're engaged, what are you doing till you get married? You wait for the marriage to take place, right? Because you have a promise of being married, but you're not married yet. Hence, engagement time. So when you're engaged, you're waiting for it to happen, yes? What did Jesus, what are we expected to do with the fact that Jesus said that he's going to go up after he's died on the cross and been resurrected again, he's going to be taken up and he's going to go and prepare a place for us. What are we doing in the meantime here now? We're waiting for it to happen. And Jesus is up there, if you may. Uh, this is how I think. 
Jesus is up there. He's preparing everything, getting it ready for us. But he said that he's going to come back when the gospel has been preached to all the nations, all the tribes, all the language groups. So what is Jesus doing now? He's waiting. And what are we doing about that? I hope not we're not just waiting for it. There's something to be done while we're waiting for it, yeah? We can expediate things, if you will. But when there's promises that haven't been fulfilled yet, you wait for it. And then there are things like, like we made clear here. Jesus gave a gift of peace, for example. And we don't need to wait for that peace because he gave it already. He said, this is yours. I'm leaving you with this. It's not something that you're going to wait for. I'm leaving you with this gift of peace. The peace of God that surpasses anything and everything else that can fill your heart and mind. You need to walk in it. You need to daily walk in that peace. The same goes for the love of God. You need to walk in God's love. Daily walk in the love of God. The joy in the, of the Lord. People are looking for happiness. There's joy to be found in Jesus Christ. And you don't have to look for it. You don't have to wait for it. You just walk in it. You can experience joy every day in your life, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what you're facing. And this is not a cliche. It is truth. But it comes down to whether you're walking with Christ. How's your relationship with him? Because if you are walking with him, if you are with him, you do have peace, love, and joy. Amen? Who believes that? Come on. And now we have this new precious life inside of us. Now what do we need to do about that? We need to live it out. We need to live it out. It's the righteousness of God. It's the holiness of Jesus Christ. And we need to live it out. Paul, uh, in, in ways of summarizing his application of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the new creation life that we have now entered into, that has been stirred up and, and, and birthed in us because of the Holy Spirit residing in me, I have this new life now, and Paul summarizes the application of this great gospel of Jesus Christ in, in, in a very simple phrase. Take off the old and put on the new. Take off the old and put on the new. That's how you live out this new life that you have inside of you. The question remains, how do you keep it? Because when you have it, how do you keep it? Because many lose it. How do we sustain it? How do we cultivate it? How do we nurture it? How do we keep it alive? If you have something really precious in your life, say you have a really, really precious plant, whether it be a tree or a flower, a rare breed, kind, uh, that, that needs attention. You want to keep it alive, right? You want to keep it alive, and so you're going to do whatever it takes to make sure that it stays alive because you value it. It adds value to your life. Um, it might be a relationship that you have. You need to tend to that relationship. You just can't take it for given that you, you married once and you said you loved once and then after 50 years it's still going on strong and flourishing and beautiful and, and fulfilling. No, you need to tend to it. You need to, you need to keep it going. Amen? You need to make every effort you can to keep it alive. It's, it's like a candle, that, that flame that seems so fickle and if, if, if there's a gust of wind, it just blows it out. What do you do if you, if, you, if you want to keep that flame alive? You need to tend to it. You need to, you need to do something. You need to protect it. You need to uh, make sure that it keeps on going. Uh, just yesterday, I heard a, a, a youngish woman uh, explain how, you know, she was 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. And throughout all those years, she thought that she knew it all. Then she got pregnant. 
And then she gave birth to her firstborn son, who's 11 now. And she was explaining how everything changed. And all of a sudden, she realized that she doesn't know much at all. But when, when the first time she held that little first you know, that, that newly born baby in her hands. The first time she held him in her hands, she said that everything changed. And all the priorities became clear. Her number one responsibility was now to make sure that this baby stays alive. She didn't know much. She didn't understand much about what she was supposed to do, but she knew that somewhere inside of her, she had what it takes to keep this baby alive. And she just wanted to keep the baby alive. When you have something precious, you want to keep it going. You want to keep it alive. How do you do it? I'm going to go back briefly to last Sunday. You need to see it first. There's a saying, seeing is believing. And then the Bible says, faith is conviction of things not seen. Which is it? Is it that seeing is believing or is believing conviction of what you can't see? Let me suggest that it's both. Both are true. Somebody's brain is going on, on over overdrive right now. You see, you can see the unseen in your imagination. Uh, there's, a, there's a space that God created inside of us where we can see stuff that isn't tangible in front of us. I can go back to all kinds of moments in my life. Why? Because they, they fill my imagination. When I just go back to some, some events, some place, some person, I can imagine what it was like. I can see, I can smell, I can hear the voice. I, you know, that's our imagination. That's the eyes of our heart. And when you add the spiritual aspect to it, and this, what the Spirit does with our imagination, we can see the unseen realities that are more real than the reality that we live in right now. Because is it true that Jesus is here right now? The word says so, the Bible says so, he's here right now. Can you see him? No. But if you allow your imagination to be captivated by Christ, you can see him. You know he's here. When you're worshipping, you, you, you can imagine his presence right here with us. You can't see it, but you see it. Because you're convicted. You have a conviction about it being real and true. Now, people see all kinds of weird stuff. I, I give you that, you know, there's, there's, but we're not going there today. We'll just leave that aside. Legendary Walt Disney died before Disney World in Florida was built or, or opened up. And it was opened on, uh, or in 1971, almost five years after Walt Disney passed away. And someone commented... Uh, to the director, the creative director of, of, of Disney Studios, that isn't it too bad that Walt Disney didn't get to see this? And the creative director simply answered, exactly, he did see it. That's why it's here. We can see the unseen. And how much better is it instead of an imaginary, funnest place on earth, we can actually see something that is truly real and the best place in the universe. The best being, the best thing, God himself. We can see something about him. Do you see him? Seek him. Ask for revelation about him, his word. Let it take over your imagination un until it becomes so real that you know that you can see and you're convicted by what you see and it changes you. And then just stand in awe of what that does in your life, seeing the unseen realities of God's kingdom. I said last Sunday, that it's what I see that determines what I become. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord, that's the focus, 
are being transformed into the same image, imagination, into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For the, this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. The God we know is the God in our mind. We, we, we need to spend more time looking at Jesus, gazing upon Jesus, allowing him and the vision of him fill our hearts and our minds, our inner being, the eyes of our heart, our imaginations. Because you love God to the degree you, you picture God as loving. You'll experience joy in your life to the degree that, that you can imagine God being joyous. And the more loving I see God, the more loving I will become to others. Amen? What you see is what you become. So see it. In order to keep it alive, you need to see it. Yeah, Gary? You need to see it. Then, you need to stay out of its way. This is just some practical, this is a very practical message today. Very practical stuff to wrap it up. You need to stay out of its way. This is true for us personally, and it's especially true when it comes to ministry, uh, in ministry life and, and churches. Because sometimes we just tend to get in the way of what God wants to do. Uh, because we're, we're either too hasty, we have the timing wrong, uh, we're, we're, our minds are so, we're, we're so excited about the, our own ideas and, and what we've come up with, we're so consumed with our own zeal and our own passion that we get in the way of God, what God is actually doing. Maybe it's because I'm too naive, I'm too immature, and I get in the way of what God is doing because I don't understand his ways yet. And so because I don't understand his ways, I, I tend to sort of go about it my way, and I get in his way in the process. Sometimes it's just ignorance. Sometimes it's because we're so self-absorbed and self-centered, and we all have this tendency, even now, don't we? Or maybe it's because we're not listening carefully enough. We're not seeing properly. And so we get in the way of what God is doing. Like I said, often it can be just, we want to rush things. We want to happen to now, like yesterday. It, it should be happening already. And so we rush in front of, and we get the timing wrong. Go and ask Will for a good, Will's over there back in the balcony. He's got a good thing about this. I won't say it out loud because you could just go to him and ask, what was that thing about the timing and, and the timing being right and, and so on? Sometimes we get in the way of what God wants to do because of our own experience. We start relying on our own experiences and the accumulated knowledge that we have uh, with, with walking with God for a few decades already. And so that gets in the way. The good gets in the way of the better or the best. Or sometimes we just feel that it's too much and we try harder. And we try to go about it in our own strength and we get in the way of God. This happened to Paul until he learned that it is in his weakness that God's power is actually revealed in the greatest measure. And even though you've learned this lesson a few times, you'll come around a few more times to, to realize it again. Uh, I had a really great experience at Ablaze uh, a week and a half ago. It was just this simple Ablaze. Uh, we were listening to God uh, through the scripture and, and God was speaking. And that went on for about 45 minutes. I just gently let it. And then there was this, this presence in the room. And I just stepped out of the way. And people kept on staying there, listening, and then praying over each other for about another 45 minutes. That's the best stuff. That's the most beautiful moments that you can uh, experience when you know that I just need to get out of the way and allow him to do what only he can do because it is about him all the time. Well, you can see it. You stay out of its way. And that's how you can keep it alive. Also, you fail towards it. You fail towards it. There's no fear in failing. We had a few songs this morning about fear. Uh, because it, it comes to some very, very easily. 
Uh, to some, it might be uh, good to have some fear in, in them occasionally. But anyway, there's no fear in failing. Why do we have this fear of failing? What we should fear more, and this is a good kind of fear, is, is playing it safe. Fear playing it safe when it comes to God. Amen? Because sometimes failing is a necessity. What if instead of failure meaning that you missed God, as we sometimes interpret it in the church world, you know, somebody failed. I remember in Canberra, I, I intentionally, I even told the congregation that I'm going to initiate a, a, a program that I know will fail. Just for the sake of us, uh, you know, getting used to the fact that not everything succeeds. And I want to do it because I'm the leader and I want to model it. It's okay to fail. I got some really nasty emails a few months later when it did fail. Because <laughs> people are so stuck in the mindset that if you, if you, you can only do things that you're 100% sure that you heard from God, and if you heard from God, it will definitely succeed. Well, sometimes even when you hear from God, it takes two or three times to get it right to really hear the accurate details about how to go about it for it to succeed and bear fruit. Failing is okay. Can you say that out loud? Failing is okay. Say it out loud. Thank you. You just gave me a huge uh, permission to fail. Whew, big burden off my shoulders right there. <laughs> Thanks for encouraging me. Why is it okay? Why, why is it sometimes a necessity even to fail? Because failure allows us to see God more clearly and accurately. Sometimes we just need to fail to see God better. Stumbling even is okay if you then quickly look up, look up at Jesus. You can stumble. Don't be fearful of stumbling. If you focus on not stumbling, what's going to happen? You're going to stumble because that's what you're focusing on. But when you stumble, just be quick to look back up at Jesus and it's okay to stumble even occasionally. Isn't that freeing? Good. Think about Peter. Peter could not have been who he became and done what he would do unless he failed miserably. And he failed miserably a few times. He got it completely wrong. But he kept on going. He kept on stumbling, he kept on getting back up, kept on moving forward, stumbling, failing, and kept on getting back up and looking at Jesus all the time. Peter on the water, right? He steps out in faith, he's full of boldness and courage and, 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 and he's fearless, he sees Jesus, he sees Jesus, he sees Jesus just moving towards him, and then he starts sinking. But what does he do? He, he fails forward towards the outreached hand of Jesus who pulls him back up. Jesus is going to be crucified. He's there in the, in the courtyard uh, being interrogated, uh, intimidated, whatever the soldiers were doing and the high priests and, and the whole gang. And, and it was actually the, the high, high priest and, and his gang in this moment. And, and Peter's there. And three times somebody comes and asks him that, aren't you, like, don't you know this Jesus guy? And he says, no. I'm sure we've seen you around. You know, you've been with him. No, 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 no. Three times he denies. Even knowing Jesus fails miserably. But what happens when Jesus is, the, the, the disciples are out there fishing and Jesus is, is at the shore and they don't know who it is, but there's something being cooked there. There's a good barbecue going on at the ocean. Oh man, those are good times. And, 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 and John realizes and recognizes who it is. What, who's the first, the first one out of the boat? Peter. He wasn't fearing failure. He had failed the most, like none of us want to fail as bad as he failed. Yet he was the first one out of the boat. Why? Because through his failures, he had learned to know Jesus in a more accurate, clear, intimate, close way. This is a Jesus who is full of love and grace and mercy. And I need him. 
I don't even care what he thinks. I just know I need him. I know he's so good that no matter how badly I've failed him, I'm the first one out of the boat and I want to go to him. And when I get to him, what did Jesus do? Shortly after, they've had their breakfast, their, their, their steak and shrimp. No, it was fish. But anyway, on the barbie. And Jesus restores him because that's what Jesus does after we've failed. But sometimes you need to fail really badly to really get to know God closely. So don't fear failure. Fear playing it safe because when you play it safe, you'll just stay the same and never change. Fail towards Jesus. Look up at him. And then, to see it, you need to stay out of its way, you need to fail towards it, and you need to give up to gain it. You still good? Okay. I'll keep on going then. When Nehemiah was fulfilling faithfully what he had received from God, he was rebuilding the broken walls of Jerusalem, uh, he had a couple of really persistent enemies. Um, I'll have to cheat for the names. Sanballat and Geshem. And they invited him to a meeting a few times actually, tried to get him down from rebuilding the walls with his people to thwart the process, to get him off track, to stall him, to, to throw him off course. And Nehemiah's response is really worthy to remember. So Nehemiah says, I replied by sending this message to them. I'm doing a great work. I cannot stop to come and meet with you. There are things that we need to give up in order to gain what God has planned and purposed and in store for us. Jesus said that in order to truly gain your life, what do you need to do it? You need to lose it. You need to lose your life in order to gain your life. These are the paradoxes uh, of Jesus' sayings. So, and it makes sense because you can't have it all. Limitations are actually really helpful in life, aren't they? No, I don't think so. But it's true, regardless whether I like it or not. Limitations are needed. They're helpful. If only I had what he has, or if only, uh, you know, I was like him, then maybe I could do the things he does and be the kind of person he is and see the kind of fruit that he carries and, and, and achieve what he has achieved. If only I had what he has. Or as a church, sometimes we think that if only we had what that church, whatever it is in your mind, fill the blank kind of church that you admire, if only we had those resources or those people or that technology or that thing, then we'd be great. And, and then we'd be, see, be seeing God moving and, and souls saved and all kinds of things happening left, right and center. It seems that we never have enough. If only, if only this, if only that, then, 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 then. But what if you have everything you need to be who God created and called you to be, and you have everything you need to do what God has asked and purposed you to do? Do you believe that? I believe it. I believe I have access to everything because the Bible clearly says so, every spiritual blessing, everything, when we ask for it, even wisdom, we can get wisdom when we don't. We have access to everything I need to be who I am called to be, destined to be, and do what God has purposed and asked me to do. So, when you don't have what you think you need, God wants, to, wants you to see something that you wouldn't see if you had what you thought you needed. When you don't have what you think you need, God is actually wanting you to see something that you wouldn't be able to see at all in the first place if you had what you thought you needed. Peter, again, walking to the temple. So we looked at Acts uh, chap chapter 2, the end of chapter 2 the church there, and then in the following chapter, it starts by telling about Peter and John going up to the temple. By the way, why, oh sorry, we'll get back to that later. I'll, I'll do this Peter thing first. 
So they're walking to the temple. They see a lame man. What was the lame man asking for? Silver and gold, right? Silver and gold. What was Peter's response? How do you respond to that? Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. What did, you, what, what did Peter have? Faith. He had faith in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's what he carried inside of him. That's what he had. What did the lame man think that he needed? What was the limitation? What was the lack in his life that he thought? He, if only I had more money, more silver, more gold, more resources, then I'd be able to live a good life. But you see, God wanted him to see something that he wasn't able to see because he was focused on what he didn't have and didn't actually realize what he really, truly needed. And through Peter, God revealed to that lame man what he really needed. And that was healing. He needed to know Jesus Christ for himself. He needed Jesus in his life. That's what he really needed. And he was able to see it after Peter was able to point it out because Peter was limited. He didn't have the gold and the silver. And because he was limited, he couldn't give to the lame man what the lame man wanted and needed. If he had the gold and silver, he probably would have given the gold and silver. But because he didn't have it, he was able to reveal something more precious and more valuable to the man, which is Jesus Christ himself. So some of us need to see a God opportunity instead of an obstacle in our lives. Think about the youth room. They, you know, not enough money, not enough money. That was a good limitation because what happened? Creativity took place. Okay, let's, let's put on a fundraiser and let's get the community involved. Let's, get, let's not just have a couple of young guys come here and, and, and um, start, you know, hammering away and, and tearing down walls. And no, I don't know what they're going to do. But anyway, don't, 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 don't be alarmed. They're not going to pull down the whole church. It's going to be good. <laughs> don't fear. They might fail, but they'll get it in the end. <laughs> so they were able to engage and give all of us an opportunity to be a part of it. Not just a few. Now all of us get to participate because there was a limitation. And so all of us get to participate. The wider community gets to be a part of it. And community was built in the process already. So limitations, obstacles, they are sometimes really important. What is God wanting you to see through your biggest limitation now? What is God wanting you to see through your biggest limitation or obstacle right now? And then, see it, stay out of its way, fail towards it, give up in order to gain it, and lastly, focus on it, and by it I mean him. Whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. You're created to be filled with the breath and life of God. You're created to be in the likeness of the glory of Jesus Christ. But in order to keep it going, to keep it alive, you need to see Jesus first. You need to see Jesus first and you need to fail towards him. You need to give up other things that are less valuable. Understand that limitations are actually helpful because God wants you to see something even better. And sometimes we just need to stay out of his way. And we really, what we really need to do in order to keep it alive is to keep our focus on Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand up, shall we? It's easy to lose it. So easy to lose it. You know, the, you, you start strong and you start full of faith and, 
and this new life is just overwhelming and consuming you and it takes over and you live it out and, and, and you walk in God's peace and God's grace and God's love and, and, and the joy of the Lord is just in your heart every day. But then it's so easy to lose it. The way to get it back is to go back to the gospel because the reason why the early church had it was because of the gospel. The reason why we got it in the first place was because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was because Jesus died on the cross, is resurrected and is alive today. It's because of that. It's because of the relationship that I can have now with Jesus and through Jesus with the Heavenly Father and because of the Holy Spirit living in me that this is all possible. The rest of it is just a result of that relationship that I have with Jesus. It comes down to my relationship with Him. And that's what we need to cultivate. That's why we, 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 we need to let go of stuff in order to, to, to hold on to that relationship and cultivate that relationship. Sometimes I need to let go of, of, of um, other people's, you know, I want to see somebody, but because I need to tend to my wife, I need to let go of that thing. I need to choose. It all comes down to my relationship with Jesus. So if you've lost it, the good news is you can get it back today. You can get it back today. God wants to bring fresh revelation about Jesus Christ. Fill your heart so that you can see Him. And when you see Him, your heart is filled with Him. Revelation of God and His love and His grace and His mercy, His holiness, His righteousness. Everything that is good and pure and excellent fills your mind and you will have it again. It reignites that relationship with Jesus and then you just Keep it alive by staying close with Him, walking with Him daily in your life and it will stay alive. Amen. Because of God's grace. And that is His desire. You know He's on your side. You know He has your back. You know He's cheering for you. You know He's inviting you along. You know He's going in front of you, preparing the way. That's what Jesus does. It's because of Him that this is possible. It is only because of Him and the Holy Spirit in our lives that we can keep it alive. So let's do it together, shall we? because it's much better to do it together than on our own. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Thank you, Jesus, for this new life that we carry inside of us. Thank you for this incredible relationship that we get to have with you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for this eternal, abundant life that we have. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for opening our eyes, for revealing things that we need to see. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for, for the fruit that we get to bear because of what you do in us. Thank you for being the, 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 the seal for eternity that we have been bought. We have been redeemed. We have been adopted into the family of God. We have been forgiven. And we get to live our lives now with you, Jesus. So strengthen us again and let us see you more clearly. Amen. Do I?